Welcome to episode 444 of the Barcelona Podcast, brought to you by the Blue Water Podcast Network. I'm Jim Hilton, and he's Rafa Aldemui, and we have the awesome, awesome task of breaking down that Valencia match, but big picture stuff, we're really talking about the Liga title race, and we actually are going to pick up right where Rafa and I were just talking about online or offline and before the show, before I hit record, and that's that Rafa, I felt like this game because of a number of circumstances, I think because of how difficult it was, yet it being three points, I feel like this happened a lot this year where Barcelona don't give people enough to complain about because they win the game and they still lead the league table, but they play such a poor match that you feel like they should have deserved to lose or in Europe that they should have lost or would have lost to a team more talented in Europe. So I feel like this is another one of those games that won nothing against Valencia where people kind of stop talking about it within three, four, five hours of I guess like the clock striking midnight and that was it and we moved on and yet here you and I are more than 24 almost 48 hours later having to you know go back and try to talk about this match because now Barca don't play for an entire week before athletic club and we'll talk about the suspensions and injuries and all that stuff but yeah it's one of those weird ones where it's like all right people are done like we've done this before especially Barcelona have done this eight times already this season one nothing so how many more of these can Kool-Aid take this year until they're finally, you know, and they've earned that trophy. I feel like Kool-Aid this year will have earned that, that La Liga title as much as Barca have for the kind of games that, <laughs> that Kool-Aid have watched this year for it. I th- like I was saying, I think people, quote unquote, forgot a little bit because of how the results went on Sunday. We mm, somehow, some way got the three points and then Madrid tied against Betis. And I think that's because of the results. People kind of forgot a little bit but honestly i i i want to make this clear i'm not one of those croifis like la porta guardiola that oh we only have to win one way like i was happy winning titles with valverde and i obviously i want us to play quote unquote the right way beautiful uh football and whatnot but if we can't i understand that that being said, I like if we win the league and hopefully we do, I'm gonna be the first one celebrating. I'm not gonna be like, cause I remember back when the, the Valverde ligas, a bunch of culés were diminishing. I would expect that from Madrid fans, but culés were diminishing the importance of just winning the league, taking it for granted, and that bothered me a lot back in the day. So I'm not gonna become one of those people. That being said, I think if we can't be hypocritical and if we like if Xavi's successors, like people were so critical with, I remember back in the day when the, um, Tata Martino, the, the, remember when we lost possession against Rayo Vallecano? That was a big deal. People started, made a big fuss about it and yeah. poor old Tata Martino got the, the, ba- the bad end of the stick. Then with Luis Enrique, a lot of people, I used to live in Barcelona during that trouble year with Julio. And I, I'm like, I, the, the, what we call like the run, run, like the rumors, like people were mad at how Luis Enrique's Barcelona played like vertical counter attacking, even though we ended up winning the treble. Then with, um, Valverde, it wasn't that pretty, but we got results. He made a scheme around Messi and Suarez to protect them. People that ran for them, the Paulinos, the Arturo Vidars of the world. And we ended up winning and he still got criticized. So I think we got to be, if we, if people on Twitter were so harsh with those train, with those head coaches, I think with Xavi, not because we all love Xavi, but we got to be the same way with him. And I get it. We were missing Lewandowski. We were missing Dembele. We were missing Gavi and we were missing Pedri. Four vital players in our scheme. That being said, we were playing against freaking Valencia. At the camp, no. We should have played way better. And it's not a one-off, sadly. I think we've seen this a lot of times. Honestly, in my opinion, throughout the entire season so far, there's been more times that we've played underwhelming football than breathtaking football. That's even with the with the entire team healthy. And games that understandably so we didn't have our defense like in the Champions League our midfield in the Europa League and whatnot so to me I think we we and that's why I I was mad after the game even though we won because I think it was horrible the way we played I think our forwards didn't play well whatsoever even uh Rafinha yeah he had that one off where he ended up scoring the winning goal and somebody 
can say like, what are you talking about? He scored the winning goal, but I think he didn't play well whatsoever. He missed like he got dispossessed so many times on promising attacking plays from Barcelona that he just like against the third left back of Valencia. It was so frustrating to watch. Like even Ansu, you know how much I love Ansu. I've been on this podcast numerous times. I'm the president of his fan club, but I don't know. It seems like Space Jam, like somebody took his powers away. And then when everything is going wrong, sadly, everything goes wrong. Because right after Ferran missed the penalty, he had, Ansu has a great scoring opportunity. He hits the post and it goes out. Like That's how bad, sadly, is it's going for Ansu. And it's just a matter. And then you had Sergi Roberto. I don't like I'm he, he I'm sure he's a nice guy. I'm sure he's incredible. But I it's not that he's a bad player per se. It's what you were talking about the uh a few weeks ago. It's just that he doesn't add anything. It's not a surplus. And for me, if you're gonna play him, I know it, it wasn't gonna happen because Xavi hasn't played Pablo Torre the entire season. So I can't I get it that he wasn't gonna play. But to me, it doesn't make sense. If you're if you're gonna play Sergi Roberto, you might as well Pablo Torre. Like Pablo Torre, in my opinion, you you can disagree with me. People in the comments can disagree with me, but I don't think Pablo Torre can be worse than Sergi Roberto. Mm. So to me, yeah. so I, I I'm just letting it all out because honestly, I haven't. I was frustrated, and I'm still frustrated because I think this team, even with the players that didn't play against Valencia at the camp, no. We got to play way better this game. And then Araujo's red card, that was sadly a Kunde error that led into that red card. And then 30 minutes without a player. Like from that point onward, I understand playing defensively, bringing in Eddie Garcia and whatnot. But from minute one to minute 60, to me, it was just a, an awful performance overall. And it's been just adding and adding and adding. And I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm done for the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, that was awesome. That was a great rant. I think we honestly, and kool can back me up on this, especially those in the listening group we've been for many years. I don't think we have seen since maybe 2017 or 2018, since Frances Tomas went on an eight-minute run, since somebody has had such a good rant, um, <laughs> or at least such a long rant. I don't know a good rant, but as a long rant here on the Barcelona podcast that wasn't named me. So terrific job by you to, to, to keep the mic, keep it hot. So I want to respond almost to everything you're saying. As you were saying that, I was kind of writing my keyword down because I think big picture-wise, I want to start there and then come all the way down to Pablo Torre. Big picture wise, I keep going through the same cycle of wondering what to name these podcasts and name the five headlines because expectations against results and what we see on the field, that performance and what that and the and the necessity and the desire for trophies, those things just keep juxtapositioning each other in a really, you know, harsh way, you know, kind of smacking up against each other in a way that's uncomfortable. And I think when I when I think about you mentioned like historically speaking, that's what's interesting about the Barcelona way. That's what's interesting about the, the style of play and things like that. And we are going to talk about Xavi's particular style of play a lot more on the second show this week. Like that is a deep dive about Barcelona style, about Xavi style, and all those things. So I'm going to plug that show now. I have a special guest for that, so we're going to plug all that. But as far as the expectations of winning these games, again, little by little, little by little, I think you were totally right about that first, the initial point. That Real Madrid drawing with Real Betis and Barca going back to nine points in the table says a lot about, I think, what fans' expectations are and how quickly they're able to move on from these kind of results. Because again, I think those who are frustrated are those who believe that this team is not good enough to win that Liga trophy. Because to your point as well, the way they played yesterday was not good enough to win a Liga title. If you're going to play like that every game, teams that aren't in a relegation fight are going to take points off you. Even those in relegation fights like Ameria are going to take points off you, right? And for me, I, I think yesterday the word is suffer, the word is survival. How much of that can you take in a season? Well, I think it's a lot different than the suffering that has even done in the fall. Because in the fall, I think that team was suffering because they didn't know who each other were yet. They a bunch of big science had come from um, had come in, and also the de- the back line was not healthy. The back line was not healthy for a considerable amount of time. And now it's not an excuse that Dembélé and Lewandowski and Pedri were missing from this game. It's worrisome, as I keep saying. And maybe it's the excuse I'm giving is more the finances of the club and an inability to bring in extra help. I think that's a bigger problem here than Barcelona playing poorly without Pedri and Lewandowski and, and Dembele. I think, again, that, that reason is pretty solid as to why they're playing as bad as they are. And that's why, as I've mentioned the last few weeks, losing Juan Araujo for Athletic Club is horrifying. I mean, because even if you get Robert Lewandowski back, it looks like Pedri and Dembele won't be fit 
until El Clasico, and then what will you get from them in El Clasico? And that does bring up the next point, that Athletic Club and Real Madrid, the next two matches could very well decide the Liga. If not, this game may have actually decided the Liga with Barca going up nine. Uh, because if Barca even get a draw against Real Madrid, they are certainly in the driver's seat for the rest of, for the rest of this Liga season. There's 24 match days already played. And again, Barca are up nine. So mathematically, there's no reason why they shouldn't win the title. And I understand the fear that a lot of people have that if they're going to play like this, they're going to drop points. Now, again, the only solace I have is that two matches from now. So he'll be what? For the last nine matches, and I'm trying to see if I do my math right. For the last nine match days of this season, Pedri in theory will be back. And Dembele in theory will be back. And I don't think that team with those two in tow wind up dropping enough points, right? So by the time they get back, is it going to be six points or is it going to be three points because Barca lost to Athletic Club and then they lose Real Madrid, even with Pedri and Dembele, right? And now it's three points and now you're talking about a real proper title race. Um, but historically speaking too, about you know Barcelona and the expectations of these kind of seasons, you know, you're right about the, you know, discrediting, uh, the discrediting that was done for Valverde and even Luis Enrique. And I think when it comes to kool <laughs> I do kind of wonder, other than because of this club success is built on Johan Cruyff and Pep Guardiola and all that stuff, with the exception of the dream team and the exception of Pep Guardiola's years, like has Barca played a certain way? Like they've been playing this kind of way, if you will, for now five or six seasons now, right? I mean, because I was thinking when you were talking too about uh, different names and comparisons, and I- I'm going to wrap my point up in a second by getting to Ansu and Pablo Torre, but when I think about even Rakitic, as I watched in the Sevilla match the other day, I don't know why I did that to myself, but watching Sevilla, Thinking about even Rakitic, and I think that when I look at his numbers, I look at his trophies, I look at his impact at the club, I think he is arguably a top 50 player. Now, I think I had him 46, 47, and with the success of Pedri, even two or three seasons, like I, even Rakitic might be pushed down to 60s, 70s, wherever he fits. But I think he's a top 50 player on the club, history, maybe top 75. But he doesn't feel comfortable if I'm building an all-time lineup or anything like that. I don't even think of his name because very much like a Bern Schuster, he never fit. It never made sense. Like it wasn't like, oh, that player is a Barcelona way. And Bern Schuster, by the way, back in the '80s, that was a club that was just desperately looking for any trophy at all. They just wanted to get anything, Copa del Rey, whatever, because that was a trophy. I mean, that, that was a team that was starved of trophies. So Bern Schuster, they were just trying to get anything done. Then, of course, Cruyff changed our philosophy, changed the way that Barca play, and then those expectations of what a Barca player can do, right? And hindsight, especially when we're talking about the young players, to bring this all the way back to Valencia. Right, I saw a lot of people calling for Pablo Torre, and I've said in the last few weeks, we don't know what happens, not only in training, but we don't know why he's not ready. Right, And this may all make sense, and it'll be fine if in three years' time, Pablo Torre is a regular fixture in the club. Right, like We don't know what his future is. Like You would assume that by not playing a player like that, he's 19 years old, you're going to ruin his career, and he's going to get the Ricky Pooch thing, and he'll be gone in two seasons. Right, But we don't know if this one season of figuring it all out, and for financial reasons, Barcelona have to rely on him in some way. There's going to come a time next season, likely, where they're going to have two or three injuries and they're going to have to rely on, if it's still Pablo Torre, unless he, you know, jettisons himself out of the club. But it's going to be his choice whether or not he fights for his spot or leaves. Xavi said, hey, go out on loan. He didn't do it. He said, go out, play with the Barca Athletic. He didn't do it. So now he's sitting on the first team bench. And I think almost to defend Xavi on the Pablo Torre point as well, this game and many of these games, looking at the last three months, while Barcelona are getting results, they're all one nothing. They're all 10 men. They're all close to it. So you're not seeing Estanis Pedrol getting a chance with Barca up 3 nothing. Pablo Torre would be in these games, I think, if they were up 3 nothing right, against Valencia. You would have seen him, but you can't because Barca is fighting and suffering and surviving and defending for those final, whatever it is, every game, 30, 40 minutes. They're just hanging on to these one goal victories. And, you know, in those kind of situations and setups, at the end of the season, would you say, would you rather have played Pablo Torre or would you rather have won the Liga? And I think that's the question Xavi's asking himself because he's seeing something in training as to why Pablo Torre isn't ready. And in the case of Ansu, this one's tough too because it's hindsight. If you had told me where Ansu would be in Barca history when he was 17, I would put him in a different spot than him at 20 because the last three seasons have been the way they've gone, right? And so there's, a, there's also this future where Ansu, it's what, three inches to the left a little bit? And all of a sudden he's got it in the back of the net and it might be the start of something else, right? So it's like Ansu can rewrite his whole history. Maybe not this season. I think this season's kind of lost, but by next season, I mean, he's on big wages. Like I know other clubs are going to come calling and Barca might move him on, but I don't know if they, I see that happening. I think there's at least one more year of Ansu kind of failing up 
Because again, I look at Marcus Rashford, he's 25 and he's finally exe- everything that Manchester United fans criticize of him for years of not being. So to, to bring it back to Ansu and Ferran Torres and that penalty miss, because we'll talk about the goal in a second, but just that penalty miss. It came out after the game that kind of ruined the whole drama of it. Rafinha and Xavi both said, well, Xavi didn't say this, but Rafinha had said that Ferran Torres started the game and that's why he was picked to be the starter and Ansu uh, to be the, the, the penalty kick taker. So Ansu knew what the hierarchy was, right? And Kessi, who is the second best penalty taker on the team behind Lewandowski historically, like we're talking just sheer numbers, like Kessi is good at from the penalty spot, that because he came on as a sub, he wasn't an option either. That Ferran Torres was selected to be the penalty kick taker in that match. Do you agree with Xavi? And do you agree with everybody kind of, you know, saying, hey, this is the way it was. This is how we set it off. And, you know, was Ansu really truly in the wrong here? And even to that point, is this a story at all? Like, can we just forget about this very quickly? Because, you know, Ansu wanted it. They said, no, Every, the more experienced players said, hey, I know you want your form. We love you, you want your confidence. But like, it's, it's, it's Ferran Torres' goal. Because if he scores that goal, we're not having a conversation with it. But because he misses it, now we're having a conversation. I agree with Xavi. I think Xavi, uh, as much as I love Ansu, I think he was in the wrong after we found out what you just said. If we, everybody knows that Ferran is going to be the, the penalty taker in this specific game. If there's a penalty and he's on the pitch, then to me, Ansu, with his stress and his current situation, unnecessarily brought that upon Ferran. Like, you don't need to put that pressure on your teammate. You know you're not supposed to take the penalty. I know you want to. You want to help the team. You want to score and whatnot. But everybody knows it was Ferran, like within the team at that point. It was Ferran's penalty spot. So why are you unnecessarily bringing more stress to Ferran? I'm not saying Ferran necessarily uh, missed because of that, but it certainly didn't help. So I think Asu was in the wrong. I don't think this is a story between them and whatnot, but I do think that this is another yet another example of how I think Ansu's problem is mental. He just seems like mm-hmm. the way when he bursted through the scene when he was, what, 17, 18? What is normal oh, 16. for a 16, yeah, 16. 16, 17? What is normal for a winger at that age is to be fast, to be able to take on people. But when you get to, but when you get to the final third, you tend to make the wrong decision, whether that is to shoot, to pass, Because the game hasn't slowed down yet. That is what happened to Vinicius that we, ah, guilty as charged. But we made fun, I made fun of him because that is what's supposed to happen. That's what happened with Rovinho back in the day. They're so fast, but the game hasn't slowed down. So they tend to just like a deer in the headlights. They don't know what to do when they get to the final third. And more often than not, they tend to make the wrong decision. With Ansu, And with Mbappé, when he bursted through the scene, that's what set them apart in a way that at 16, 17, when they got to the box, it seemed as if everything slowed down. They, 90% of the time, they made the right decision, whether that was to shoot or to pass. So to me, I was like, wow, this guy is a gem, Ansu Fati. So I never in a million years thought that he would regress in that aspect. The biggest worry that everybody had and I had was the physical one, an MCL, I mean, a meniscus tear. So you're like, oh, is it is the same thing that happened to Jesse, to Asensio? Obviously, there was like ACL, but whatever, knee injuries. Are they going to be fast enough? Yeah. Are they going to have that burst of speed in, in, in short amount of spaces and whatnot? And to me, physically, I see Ansu Fati just fine. It's what I thought would never happen. Like his touches are most, most of the time bad. They're long. I'm like, That what's happening to Ansu? He seems like just stressed when he gets to the box. Like he usually he was so calm and would just wait the perfect time to even get a shot up, whether that it would go in or not. He would have that calmness about him. Now he just seems so stressed to get the shot off that more often than not they're blocked, and it's just sad to watch in a way. And I think the the whole penalty thing, Ansu knowing that he wasn't the penalty taker yet going up to Ferran and asking for the ball is just rounds up the mental block that yeah. Ansu sadly has at the moment. Well, I, I think this is actually a great example to compare Ferran Torres, Ansu, and Rafinha. 
because what you said about the young, young players, that is true about young wingers. It's all about the moments against consistency because 16, 17, 18, 19 year olds, how many of them have we seen through the years? I mean, that's why Vinny Jr. got the move to Real Madrid in his first few seasons. He would have moments and, and Real Madrid fans would say, hey, this kid's got these little special moments. And Ansu at 17 was special. And Ferran Torres, I, I, I glo- even though he's 23, he just turned 23 last week on February 29th, which didn't exist this year. But he, So he just turned 23. But Ferran Torres debuts for Valencia at, I believe, it. well, he made his first team like regular appearances at 17. And he leaves by 19 to, I believe, or right before 20, whatever it was, he, 19 or 20, he leaves for Man City, right? But with Valencia, he was still just that. Like he had time, he got minutes because it's Liga and those kind of clubs like Valencia have to play their academy kids, especially the one that they could sell on later. Thanks, Peter Lim. But for Ferran Torres, like he would have his moments when he was a teenager at Valencia. And then with Man City, you go to the EPL, and if you're not immediately consistent, then you're going to be on the outs looking in. On, I mean, that's the way it is. Like you, you're, you have to be. You, moments are not good enough in the Premier League for young players. That's why they're they're all shipped out. Like that's why being a, an English player, a young teenage English player, is so difficult. That unless you're you're lighting up in the Championship or a lower level team in the EPL, like it's hard for those those teenagers to really break through and get that many opportunities. That's why when you see what Mikel Arteta does with the teenagers, you're like. I mean, that's risky and it's all paying off and it's great because when it pays off, you're a genius. But when it doesn't and you waste the talent and you waste a player because they couldn't turn those moments into consistency and your club results are suffering for that, that's a big deal. And again, I think that's the difference between I still love Ferran Torres because again, he has never really been consistent. He had those moments when he was a teenager at Valencia and he's never been consistent since then. And at 23, as a winger, as a false nine, as I know we had those moments for Spain, but still for Spain, it was moments and it wasn't the consistent, he's going to start every match, right? So I think both him and Ansu, I put in these moments to consistency and that's the pressure of Real Madrid, of Barcelona, of Manchester United, of Liverpool, of, um, of I mean, AC Milan at times when they're on top of the game and Bayern Munich. Like you can be a young player, but if you don't become a consistently great player, then you're going to be out of those clubs the fan base has turned on you and it's done. And that's the difference between a young player and one ready for the spotlight. And that's why I, I get to Rafini here because that's the interesting contradiction. When I watched 90 minutes yesterday of Ferran Torres and Ansu and Rafinha, I'm like, was Rafinha that much better or worse? Or, or was Ferran Torres and Ansu that much worse than Rafinha? Even all season long, like watching them minute by minute, are they that much worth, worse? No. But Rafinha's 17 goal and assist or goal contributions are second on the team, right? So the eye test doesn't match the numbers for Rafinha the same way, to be honest with you, the eye test did not match for Ferran Torres last year. Ferran Torres in six months was more consistent than he has been this season. And even though he looks like the same player, he was better last season because he still contributed goals and assists to the team and he helped results. So Rafinha, again, he winds up having a finishing product, whether he's scoring the goal or getting the assist because he, he's able to find, even when he's playing like... You know, when he, even when he's losing yesterday, three of eight of his dribbles, like he was three of eight on his dribbles. I can say 20 year old Jesus Vasquez that behind Jose Gaia and Tony Lato should not have been playing and look completely lost for large spots of that game. So Rafinha to go three of eight against that kid, not great for Rafinha. But as I said, we can trust that Rafinha still is have, he's able to have over the course of a season enough moments of just quality of brilliance. He's able to make that run and, and contribute that goal or the assist. And he is consistent. He's consistent in what Barca bought him for. So is he worth his price tag? The numbers say yes. The eye test says no. And kool is obviously are going to often go by the eye test and say he hasn't been worth it. And I think that, again, is a big difference between those two, that being Torres and Ansu, who are lost because they are unable to take their moments and turn them into consistency, while Rafinha has consistently contributed moments over the course of a season to make, not again, that price tag worthwhile, but to make his role and basically his job and his contribution in the squad just makes sense as an experienced 26 year old. Thank you for bringing up Rafinha because I, I wanted to talk about Rafinha and it, it's a great point and you, that you bring because I, it's it's it, it's 100 percent correct. The one thing is the eye test and one another thing is is the numbers. Like if you're a Rafinha Stan or you want to give him time and this or that. You're going to be like, what are you talking about, Rafa or Dan or whoever? Look at the numbers. And I completely agree with that. But if you watch the actual game, the 90 minutes, it seems like Rafinha has that one spur, that one moment and that 
more often than not in this league, specifically in the league, has equaled important points for Barcelona, where they're, whether it's an assist or a goal. But throughout the 90 minutes, and and I it, it's and I'll say this in my opinion, my problem is it's because of his price tag and the economic situation of Barcelona. Because if this was Barcelona back in the day, us splashing 50, 60, 70, whatever he ends up costing, and us not having financial problems, I wouldn't care whatsoever because it's whatever we got money. So 70, quote unquote, wasted or a player that is not worth that amount. I wouldn't care. But now that we got to count pennies and when we make those big investments, whether it's him, Kunde, or Lewandowski, we don't have the luxury of not of failing in those big uh, signings. They got to deliver. Kunde has been delivering. Lewandowski has been delivering. Obviously, 2023, he hasn't played that well, but he has delivered overall so far. And Rafinha, I know for the numbers part, He has, but if you look at the games, he can't go by anybody. Like, for more often than not, when I see him, I know that he's not going to go by his left back, whether it's a top left back in the world, which I get it. You, it's It should be 50-50 in a way. But against the third string left back of Valencia, and you literally can't go by, by him, then to me, that defeats the whole purpose. There were so many times... Like whether it was a like a, a, not a set piece, but like where Valencia had their defense set, or whether it was a quote unquote counter attack where he would get the ball and he would lose it. Like if that if if he had made the correct choice or, or would have gone by his defender, that would have been a clear goal scoring opportunity, whether it was for him or for another teammate. And then we're talking about maybe this game is two zero three zero instead of one zero. So to me, that's why I'm so frustrated. With Rafinha, it's because of the amount that we paid for him. I'm expecting somebody that will affect the game throughout the 90 minutes in a way that the team will, will be set up to score more than yeah. two, three, four goals. And I think, sadly, with Dembele gone, our other wingers, for different reasons, of course, aren't up to their standards of what we, a team like Barcelona, should expect from them because Ferran, he, oh, he's been playing a little bit better when he's the last few games as a right winger. I'm, saying, I'm not going to fault him as a false nine whatsoever. But Ansu isn't right. Rafinha, for the most part, he's playing because Dembele's hurt. And then this whole thing that you don't get consistency throughout the 90 minutes of a Brazilian winger on top of that. like When you hear Brazilian and winger, you're expecting somebody that's going to take your breath away. Like that's why more, yeah. more more often than not you're used to yes and no. Yeah, but I think I think him, you know, not really becoming himself or not really becoming a big name until he was 23 and 24, and also not making his name in the Brazilian league, but and going to Europe on a huge number straight from Brazil. I think all of those things kind of mean that his stock is 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 always down. Like they always view him as a B option more than the, you know, the A or the A plus option, like the future. Neymar's and as you mentioned, Ronaldinho, Rubinho, Vinny Jr., even Rodrigo was, you know, the red carpet thrown out for him or Endrick, right? Unless you're a top, top, even if, if Barcelona is, if the rumors are to be true that Victor Roca for 40 million is going to happen over installments, like that player, of course, is going to be christened in a way, even if Rafinha has a better career, even if his numbers over the course of 10 years are better, like just, it's just coming up for sporting CP and, you know, making the moves that he did quietly. Again, he also didn't start even at a huge major academy in Brazil. So I think all those things go into it. And You know, to, to Rafinha's credit, though, it must be said, Barcelona yesterday kind of adapted to not trusting him <laughs> in that Valde was four or five on his dribbles. And usually, as we know with Dembele, the way that I, we expected Barca to play this season was very much so what Pedri has a lot to do to connect the left side to the right side. And also not having Pedri there again, Roberto in his place was a huge part of this. And I don't blame Rafinha for this truly, because when you're playing without Pedri, that means you cannot give him basically this whole right interior middle of the field to right interior side because you're putting numerical overloads on the left, right? Because if you look at when Gabi and Pedro are starting together in that four-man midfield, then you have on the left, you have um, you have Gabi who's moving over to Balde. Balde's overlapping, right? When Gabi's the inside winger. And then you have De Young in behind who also can make those penetrative dribbling runs. Gabi will tuck in or Balde will stay at home. And then Lewandowski shifts, uh, shifts slightly over to the left for that numerical overload, right? 
Somebody, you move it horizontally, either back to Busquets, and he gets it wide to Dembele, or it's Pedri who makes the right decisions, retains the ball, and shifts that ball over. Or again, it's De Young or somebody else, or the left center back, usually Christensen, to deliver that diagonal ball over to Dembele on the right. And now it's a 1v1 uh, situation. So that's how you get him in those 1v1 situations when the other team is trying to double team him, right? But when you have Roberto, you cannot task Roberto with not only covering that space and retaining the ball and making those very quick decisions to get the ball over to Rafinha in 1v1 situations. But even on the left then, you because you don't have that option, that means that the numerical overloads have to also come from the right. You have to balance the attack. And that's why Balde was so, I'd say, good yesterday because Barcelona kind of conceded that this is what Rafinha is not going to get done for us. We cannot trust him to have it completely relied on him in 1v1 situations. So there was a lot more responsibility on Balde to get forward and be uh, that that dribbler that winds up you know, breaking open the back line from the left side of Barcelona's attack. And I, I think so much response was given to him. And it does kind of remind you, too, that age does matter in this case, that Balde... And why I've been so excited about him is that he has consistently gotten better. And the things that can still improve, like to me, is his decision making in the final third. Like he's so good, you cannot stop him from making at least two runs a game inside. He's going to get inside with that dribble on the on the underlapping run, and you cannot stop it. His decision making in the final third is what you'd expect from a player who has not played first team football in, I mean, again, with all those injuries last year, two years. And this is his first time in the first team. He just turned, he's 18 years old. He's going to be 19. So it's like, you know, how much can you expect from Alejandro Balde? I think he's giving us more than we expect. And now you're kind of waiting for the rest of it to get put together. Very much like we've seen the improvements from Gabi this season, um, who also wasn't in that game against Valencia. So the last point here then on the tactics too, because uh, it was Busquets who delivered that, that great assist yesterday. But I don't, I can't necessarily blame Roberto because I thought Roberto and Kessie was actually better in that game than De Young and Roberto, believe it or not because they had 10 men for most of Kessie on the field. But it was also what Oscar Hernandez, the acting manager, and Xavi fixed at halftime. And it's that in that 3-2-5, when you're attacking in that way with the, the, the double pivot, De Young and Busquets, when it's Pedri and Gabi, they stick to that too. And you know this is going to be De Young and Busquets, 3-2-5, pushing the five up, up high. But yesterday, De Young and Roberto, neither were oscillating back to be the the other two in that two setup. So Barcelona wound up attacking in a 3-1-6 formation or a 3-1-3-3, whatever you want to call it. And that was not working because again, Roberto just doesn't, not say he has a mobility, but he has a certain job. But if he doesn't cut out that initial pass, he's in trouble. And he, he has to be far forward. Like him, both he and Kessie want to get very far forward to make a run into the box to be useful offensively because they don't, they're not, useful with these penetrative pa- these penetrative passing that doesn't happen, right? Like they, they just can't do it with the final ball. They don't do it with the ball of their feet. They do it with their legs. And so you're having them push so far forward. But if nobody's coming back, that being De Young on the left or Roberto on the right, if nobody's coming back to support Busquets, that was a major issue for me in the game more than anything offensively was that Barcelona kept getting beat in the middle of the field by Valencia. Like Valencia, I mean, they were almost surprised. They're like, hey, you know, we're, we have not really had much attacking force this season at all. We're fighting relegation, yet Barca are giving us, at home, wide open part of the field, right? Like, it, it's not Busquets' fault in the counterattack. If anything, the fact that Barcelona got a clean sheet is a credit <laughs> to Busquets' defensive acumen and kind of putting everyone where they needed to go defensively because it was just worrisome. And then the second half, I guess it's impressive that Barcelona managed to figure this out even before 10 men. When Kessie came on, you would notice that he or Roberto, they were much better about when the ball's on the right, Kessie is back with Busquets in a double pivot. When the ball's on the left, Roberto drops in as a double pivot. And it was much more structured defensively. And again, I've been really happy defensively with what this team is. And eight goals conceded in 24 matches, that says what you need to know in the Liga. Because when the bigger teams in Europe, they've taken advantage of their talent of Barca's defensive mistakes. But because again, the talent in Spain has not been good enough to adjust, all Barcelona needs to do really, it's just like adjust once. And that's even good enough when, the, when you go down to 10 men. No, I agree. And the thing with, uh, I'll finish my Rafinha rant, is that I'm going to go back to what Xavi said after the during the press conference after the uh, Valencia game, but he was talking about Valencia and the Real Madrid game. He said that back in the day, the only team that basically pressured you up high was uh, Paco Gemes' Rayo Vallecano. Now, 
almost every team presses you high up one on one. So basically everybody is uno con uno, one on one. So you need players that are able to go by their respective defensive player. And that's why obviously we know that we have that in Dembele. Dembele can go by absolutely anybody in the world uh with his speed. Pedri can go by anybody in the world, not necessarily with the speed, but with his technique and how quickly he's able to uh, spin away from people, control the ball and whatnot. So basically very Iniesta-esque. Ansu used to be that guy before his injury and even after he came back. Right now, sadly, he's not that player. So when you're missing, I'm not even, you're three, the three, be well, and then Balde is also another player, like you were mentioning, that can go by people. One, two, three, and then obviously that creates havoc, overloads, and and whatnot. So that's why to me Rafinha is so frustrating because I'm expecting him to go by people, and more often than not, he's not able to. And when he doesn't do it against lesser opposition, that frustrates me so much because for the amount that we paid for you. I, those are one of the things in your position that I'm taking, not, not for, that I I'm expecting not every game, but 90, 80% of all games. I'm accepting you to go by your man on the wing. And he doesn't do that. So that frustrates me. Then going back to Sergi, and then going switching to Sergi Roberto, it, to me, and I don't know, maybe I'm like just, but I think, He was injured for the past, what, like two years before that? It was, was it like a hamstring injury, I think? Or was that a knee? I don't know, something. I don't remember specifically. But to me, when we got muscle, out... It was definitely muscle. It was muscle well, more than it was. Yeah, it was yeah, muscle, yeah. yeah. Muscle. So to me, yeah. when we have to defend, we, we got to run back to our goal. Obviously, we can expect Kunde to run back fast. We can expect Araujo to run back fast. We're going to expect Balde to run back fast. Obviously, not Christensen, but he's not slow-ish. I wouldn't say he's slow, but he's not fast. He's in between. He's well-positioned. Busquets, we know he's slow. He has never been fast, so we can expect him to be slow going, tracking back. Kessie, I'm expecting Kessie to run fast back to our goal and need if we need to defend a counterattack. But Sergi Roberto, he was, in my opinion, as far as I remember back in the day, He didn't used to be this slow. There were so there's been so many times and in this game against Valencia, where you were talking about the midfield, we lost the ball and they were going obviously towards uh Ter Stegen's goal. I'm expecting uh Busquets to be slow, but Sergi Roberto looked like he had two bricks stuck to his both of his feet. He was so slow tracking back, and I'm like, wow, like I, we can quote unquote deal with Busquets being slow. But we can't have another slow midfielder. And he looked like he looked like he was trying to go fast, yet he couldn't. I mean, Frankie is another one that can he's he's a bullet. He can track back like a maniac. But Sergi Roberto, that's another like if you're not gonna do, in my opinion, anything offensively with the ball at your feet, then the least I'm expecting you to do is at least provide some kind of defensive help like Kessie does, because when he has to like run back and help uh, on a counterattack because again but Kessie I'm not expecting anything great of him offensively with with the ball at his feet like you mentioned I'm expecting him to do something with his legs not with the ball at his feet but with Sergi Roberto it's just, I'm not getting in my opinion either one defensively or offensively that's why I brought the whole Pablo Torre point because at least I know that Pablo Torre can deliver a ball so that's what's so frustrating when you got a Sergi Roberto that then he's obviously, I don't blame him. He's just going to do the, the, the easy part, the easy thing to do. He's just going to pass the ball sideways, pass the ball back. He, he doesn't, he's afraid of like trying to do something because he doesn't trust his own ability to do that. And he doesn't want to lose the ball in a precarious situation. And I understand that point. So to me, that's why it's so frustrating in that aspect. And I know I, the whole Pablo Torre name keeps popping up. But I'm just using him as an example of someone who I think is better qualified offensively ahead of Sergi Roberto. Like that because of this right. situation where there's no Gavi, there's no Pedri, and whatnot. So again, it's just it, it, 
it, it, it's it's frustrating to see, and I don't know if there's a magical fix. Like I, I agree completely with you that we were not in training. We don't know. That's the whole Ricky Push point. Like there came a point where if every coach isn't playing him, then that that it's not rocket science. That has to do something yeah. with the player, not with all yeah. four three different coaches whatsoever. So I guess it's yeah. I mean, it's there a, was, no, there there was a, there was a bright side though because the bright side while there was no publicatory, there was an Alakan. And I know people, you know, the, the discourse obviously is get frustrated that Victor Barbera is already going for money to, to Club Bruges probably, and he has more goals, whatever. But Alarcon coming up from the U19, again, I think there was a lot of times when you would see him warm up on the sideline. And if the result had been different, if it was 2 nothing or 3 nothing, he would have been in these games earlier. I think Xavi seems to like him. He's liked him since the World Cup break when he had him and Lamini Mall and some of those U19 players, Danny Rodriguez, up in the, the, the first team training, you know, because there was, you know, very few players there. So he had that time in there. So he's getting his time late to trust Bar- uh, to trust a youngster like that when Barca are down to 10 men and defending for their lives, I think says a lot. And I think his legs and, you know, a, a lot of it, it sounds silly, but we think so much about the game when you have the ball and Barcelona fans can do that and should do that, right, about possession. Um, but so much of it too, winning the league of title is about what happens when you don't have the ball. And I've liked so far what Alacan has done when Barca have not had the ball, right? Uh, running down into space, pressing, his pressing seems to be, um, intelligent. He seems to know when to run and when to close down space. And um, yeah, and I like that. So to to close this game out, because I think for the Sergio Berta thing, not to say I want to continue to push that off, but I did write a Barcelona.com article about why Barcelona, why the heck they would re- uh, <laughs> renew Sergio Roberto. We will do that on a podcast, maybe this week, maybe next week. Um, you know, as Pedri gets healthy and Gabi gets healthy, we might have to like talk about that less. But now that Roberto will be around for a whole nother year, we can try to figure that out for a whole nother year. But Either way, last point about this game was that the two decisions that the referee had to make in the second half, he made one right, he made one wrong, and Barcelona are not hard done by for them. So the Ron Araujo red card, it's been frustrating to watch Koundé. Like, I don't have much galaxy brain stuff or X and O's or tactics to tell you as to why Koundé is struggling right now. I, I don't know. Looking at what he did in the first half of the season, I don't think he struggled at right back. I don't think he struggled at center back. Or he shouldn't be struggling at either position. I don't think positionally it's an issue for him. I, I think he's just fine either way. He has the speed. He has athletic tools. He has the passing. He has the field awareness. I'm not concerned. What, what is a concern, if you will, and I say concern in quotes, is that he is making bad decisions. And he is, um, and it just seems like he is not even totally fit or didn't come back from the World Cup right. And we've seen Lewandowski. We've seen Kunde. And honestly, that's the thing about a Winter World Cup that's weird, not to defend Kunde, but like the fact that it was a Winter World Cup, you'll see a lot of players after a World Cup year, they'll struggle for the first six months of the next season or like till the January break usually. And so I don't know, like maybe it was just, he is burnt out and fatigues. And that's something to go back to this kind of individual play does sum up one of the concerns, obviously moving forward to this season is that Araujo gets the red. And to me, that's, I'm going to be glass half full about it. He has been dealing with muscle fatigue. He's an often injured player. He had an injury in the fall. And for Xavi to kind of say and be honest, like, hey, this player's dealing with muscle fatigue. For him to not play, I know it's athletic club, and you don't want to lose that game, and that's a big scare to lose him at some MS. Of course, you'd rather have him even not play this game at home, but Barcelona felt like they had to, and they did, and and that bit him in the butt. But for Rajo, it felt like that one moment when he brought down Duro, because, again, Koundé's the one who makes the decision mistake, and he decides to head it back when the spacing is way off. He was too close to Rajo. He had to just like clear that or get it out of the way but he doesn't get enough on the header back. And now he's put Araujo in a compromised situation. Araujo in that split second, you know, he's not thinking, oh, I'm going to miss MMS athletic club. He's not thinking, oh, I need to trust Ter Stegen in this moment, right? He's just seeing a player who is on goal and maybe I can get myself in here. Maybe I'm going to get the call. Doesn't get the call. Easily a red card and he's gone because he didn't descend. Uh, sorry, descend. Because there was no dissension. It's only one game suspension for the red card. Uh, for the goal-scoring opportunity that he winds up ruining. If he had said something or whatever, it would have been two games. But it's just one game, so he'll be back to all Classico uh, to, to our understanding. And then the other call that comes in is the Kessie foul, and it was definitely a foul on Fran Perez. That is absolutely a PK late in that game, does not touch the ball, takes out the player in the box, and and Barcelona get away with one. And I feel like <laughs> I feel like Kool-Aid's with a bit of sense, don't argue with me, like, again, now that I've forayed into TikTok, I find that people hate me even more there than other places. But I feel like the 
I think fans that are understanding understand that there are there is injustice afoot at times in the Liga. And to me, as I say, over the course of a season, <laughs> as is the way I always put it, in the course of a season, Barcelona win some and they lose some, like everybody else. Real Madrid win some and win some. And that's the difference, right? Is that Real Madrid, I feel like get the benefit of the doubt more than Barcelona does. But over the course of a season, Barcelona gets some calls and they lose some calls like everybody else. If you're one of the other 19 teams, not Real Madrid, then you're going to feel hard done by in the league. And because Barcelona is so successful and because they're in more goal-scoring opportunities, then in theory, you feel like they get hard done by more than everybody else. But to me, it feels like Real Madrid get the benefit of the doubt more often, right? So that's not, it sounds, I know it's a weird phrasing of that argument, but I'm basically saying it's, it says more about Real Madrid getting good calls for them than it is about Barcelona getting bad calls because they do get bad calls. But again, if you watch La Liga and watch all the other games, everybody else gets bad calls. And so does Real Madrid, but I feel like it's always a little less than 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 everybody else. Um, so I, I think Barcelona get away with one here with Kessie. He, he brought him down. That should have been a penalty. And no, that we... changes... I mean, that, that, that call, by the way, that mistake by that referee could have changed the course of the Liga. Like they could have, that could have literally decided the Liga title, a missed call for Barcelona. So I just like, I, I wanted people like, I know Barcelona hard done by, and especially in Europe this season, that was, that was hogwash that what happened in Europe this season, the handballs well, and all that stuff. I'll, I'll so bring up of a an season, example. That foul, I'll, I agree. I, to me, that was a penalty. And I, I jokingly on Twitter, I, I posted it. Well, I embedded a video that somebody else made. You remember the, during the, uh, the elections where they had a mannequin with the Messi jersey and all the candidates would go up to it to, quote unquote, what would they say to Messi so that he stays at Barcelona and yeah. Laporta hugged it? Somebody else on Twitter being Twitter made an edit, and instead of the uh, Messi jersey, it's a referee jersey. So Laporta's like hugging mm. the referee jersey, kissing it. So I jokingly said like, oh, thank God, finally the payments came through and we... we <laughs> Got our money's worth because, yeah, it to me that was a penalty, and I was surprised I didn't call it. But that being said, that's it's funny to see how Real Madrid are acting uh, about this non call, and understandably so, they're mad. But to me, this call is the same as the the game against Bayern in Germany, where Alfonso Davies fouled Dembele inside, like literally inside the box, and it was. Kind of yeah, ish the same that. way. To me, that was a penalty. Also, we didn't get that call. If we got that call, Lord knows how, like you said, this could be, could change the destiny of the league. Then that call could have changed if we, the, our destiny in the Champions League. And maybe now we're talking oh, yeah. about the round of 16 of the Champions League instead of being out of the Europa League. So, It's like if you you didn't complain because that didn't benefit us, and now you're complaining because obviously you're a Real Madrid fan. So I get it. I mean, you're gonna complain about one thing, and then that's what be quote unquote being a fan is more often than not. So yes, it it kind of is what it is. But if we're gonna be nitpicking he this and that, there was also a Carvajal foul penalty on Lewandowski during the first Clasico that didn't get called. So if That's what I say to all my Real Madrid uh, friends. It's like, do you really want to start this? Because I got I got memory. And we're going to be here all day. We're going to be here all night. You're going to mention me this. I'm going to mention th you this. And then we're just going to keep going. It's never, it, it, it's never going to end. So what can I tell you? It's, it's, they're going to bring up that call. And I'm going to bring up that. Like Vinicius should have been sent off against, against Real Betis. Because Vinicius is literally getting away with yelling to the referee inches away from his face. And I think they're just scared to show him the second yellow. So at the end of the day, like, I agree with you. that That's not to say that Barcelona yeah, aren't know. benefited more than the other 18 teams. But compared to Real Madrid, I do genuinely believe that they're benefited way more than we are. So, it, and obviously... We're in a league more often than not competing against only Real Madrid, except the odd year that Atletico decides to show up. Yeah, I, mean, yeah, I think it's the one place that I generally, again, tend to be overtly biased. I, again, I don't think there's some great conspiracy. I just think that's the way it works out when, 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 when teams who have success, they do get kind of the benefit of the doubt 
um, on calls like that. And again, we also buried our bias here late in the Barcelona podcast, so the FC Barcelona podcast. So I, I think we're I think we're safe hey, from the if, you, if, if you're listening, like subscribe. Remember, if you're listening up to this point, <laughs> subscribe and like. <laughs> Sure, sure. So, yeah, and speaking of to this point, I, I think that puts the Valencia stuff to bed again. We've got another show coming on this week to to find, again, things to talk about because we've had all these midweek games recently. But the last thing I, I do want to talk about, just real quick, real briefly, when it comes to watching everything else, because I did say, right, I, I think if you watch the rest of the Liga, you, some of those games might depress you a little bit. But watch as much league as you can sometimes or tune into those games again. Real Betis and against Real Madrid, that was 0-0, but that was actually a really enjoyable game. Like, I tried to be neutral about it. Like, of course, I'm rooting for Real Betis in that game, but I try to be neutral about it and say, yeah, I mean, that was actually a pretty, you know, in hindsight, right? Like, <laughs> together they wanted to be 0 0. It wound up being an enjoyable game. Yeah, there's things that are happening. There are there are hot takes that could have happened and all those things. But um, speaking of Barcelona and watching other stuff, yesterday the Femini uh, saw Caroline Graham Hansen return. And in the 60th minute, she comes on the field. I don't know if you saw, I mean, she, I said in the five headlines yesterday because of the Galazzo. Um, that was the one that, of note, but I didn't, I failed to mention the other two goals. She also scored. She gets, she gets a hat trick. A, and it wasn't even a fortunate bounce hat trick, right? It was a fully fit top form hat trick. She comes in the 60th minute after being away for five months and then does that. So I think here's my hot take here about the, the feminine right now to, as, as they look forward now to big matches, to champions league stuff, they did have a scare against Bayern Munich, but that was without Graham Hansen. And that was without Alexi Budeas who could be returning not shortly, but in the near future. So while I think Alexi Bateas is Barca's best player for the Femini, CGH can win them the Champions League as their best player. I think this team is good enough to win if Caroline Graham Hansen goes off because she has been such a huge loss this season. And that has allowed Claudia Pena to really take that next step forward. And she's been so exciting. But Caroline Graham Hansen, she is a baller and she can get some stuff done and she can be the best player, I think, in a Champions League and a Champions League final. So to see her come back and have that hat trick, like there's always a little worry. It's like as good as Graham Hansen is, there's that little worry that you have in you that says, I mean, is she going to come back to what she is? is she, can she return to the same level when, when players are off for months and months and months? You're worried about how long it's going to take. And just, the, I mean, memory's sake, I can't think of the last time when I saw a player be gone for almost six months and then come back and within 20 minutes, <laughs> gonna like fully arrive. Just like, no, I'm back. I'm here. And not only am I back, but I'm I'm back to the top. I'm here. Don't worry about me. The only goal that I that I saw I'll admit was uh, Salma Parayuelo's goal, and it was obviously mm. it's ironic because it was against Villarreal. She played with Villarreal before, but that was that was the only one that yeah. I saw. But I'm glad that um, that Caroline is back, and then uh, hopefully, oof, I like I know I don't know. Um, I do agree that Alexia is the best player in the world. But um, I, I, I'm, I, I'm like I'm. I don't watch that much Barca Femini games. I'll, I mean, I'll admit. But when I do watch them, it's just that like, like Bomati. I like to watch Bomati, uh, Mapi Leon. I like. It's just that those like to me. It's like I, I want my defenders, like my uh, men, and women, to have that edge. Like I like my defenders yeah. to be. I say I can't say the word, but to be rough. And when I when I watch her, like she she, she seems to have that attitude, like whether it's at a game or at a uh, FIFA the best gala, like she has that that aura about her that you know, like she's walking in and you're like, damn, like she's a she's in that in a good way, of course. Like she's a nasty defender. So, uh, yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't know what else to say, yeah. but uh, you don't know, many of gamers. Yeah, the Femme of so Gamers. Good. They're and so good. Yeah, and that's and that's what the first team, the best Barca men's first team wants too. I mean, I think this next week, you know, just to, I'm not previewing at all, but the Athletic Club, like without Araujo, that's going to be a big test for that back line. And so far, Ter Stegen has kind of returned to the idea that he might be a gamer. And we've seen Christensen consistency. Like that guy doesn't look like it, doesn't look like he's saying much, but that guy's a gamer. And Kunde, he was a gamer at Sevilla. And I mean, again, he's kind of gone back into a shell here for Barcelona. So hopefully he can break out of it. And I mean, I would start, you know, we'll, 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 we'll talk about that on Thursday, but either way, again, follow Rafa, all the media football. And again, just hitting the show notes. It's easy to find him there. And then we're on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at the Barcelona pod. Hey, we're over 10,000 on TikTok. So thanks for that. Thanks for everybody who joined Look in. Look at you, um, TikTok you know, superstar. I, I, kind, of teaching, kind of teaching me um, some of the youthful, 
insults and bullying that <laughs> I, I didn't realize. I'm, hey, fame I learned some new words. I knew some new words there. Fame comes I'm, with I'm a like price. I'm, Those no, 10,000 followers are coming with a price. <laughs> I know. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate everybody. Uh, and it's all a good conversation um, ever again. Facebook group as well, the close Facebook group, there's still the same you know, people put in the news and we didn't even mention Laporte of Man City and those rumors. But again, it was another Man City link. So I don't worry about those <laughs> until the player arrives. And then, of course, we're on YouTube uh, where you can watch again all those five headlines and all the other stuff here at the Barcelona pod. So most importantly, thanks so much for listening to the show. Until next time, we'll talk to you soon in Forza Barca. Barca.